So let me give uh, 30 seconds to, uh, for those of you who still stand, to uh, sit down if you wish. You can also listen standing, it's okay. Your choice. So good afternoon, let me open this second session uh, on our responses uh, to monetary policy and financial shocks. We have a wonderful lineup uh, to uh, set the stage uh, and start a discussion. Uh, I would like to invite uh, speakers, uh, well, to thank speakers for joining, first and, and foremost, um, and also to uh, invite them to be uh, concise so that we can have time for discussion, uh, for a broader discussion uh, with the, uh, with the uh, audience. Um, and um, I would also uh, like to uh, invite you to uh, not to be, I mean, to not to feel too much constrained uh, in the presentations and discussion. That is, the, the session being titled Responses to Monetary Policy and Financial Shocks, there, can, there could be a very narrow way to look at the uh, at that discussion, which would be to focus on spillovers from the uh, uh, from ECB monetary policy and spillovers from the uh, U.S. monetary policy, and uh, and how uh, uh, CZ countries have reacted to that, uh, and that certainly will be the core of the discussion. But uh, it, we also have an opportunity to discuss um, macroprudential frameworks, financial resilience, uh, which is very much part of what both uh, President Draghi and uh, the IMF MD have uh, discussed this morning, so I will, I will really encourage you to broaden the discussion to all aspects of resilience uh, in the macro and uh, financial uh, field. Uh, and uh, last but not, but not least, it's, it's, uh, it's good to be uh, in a conference where it's not all about trade. So we, you, you, we as a group, we have an opportunity to show that it's not all about trade. Um, and I'm sure it will be exciting. So let me open the presentations with the, the First uh, keynote speaker, uh, Laurence Boone, uh, Chief Economist of the OECD. Um, thank, you. thank you, thank you, Benoit, for this uh, very nice introduction. I, I will unfortunately start by being a little narrow because in, uh, in this presentation I will focus mostly on spillover from the ECB, but I will not talk only about monetary policy, so hopefully um, it will open the door to the question that you want to raise afterwards. Um, today, I would like to discuss the macro framework, in fact, and the main message uh, I, I would like to leave you with is, is has to do with three points. And uh, the first one is that also, the exchange rate regime is generally floating for most CZ countries, and they have strived to achieve stable inflation and stable financial condition, but while showing preferences for minimizing exchange rate fluctuation in a number of them. And within this framework, as long as the business cycle is in harmony with the EMU aggregate, with the euro area, then the, the framework appears to function quite well. However, over the recent period, um, and especially because most CZ countries have rebounded and recovered from the crisis much better than the euro area, um, and inflationary pressure are building up, it, which is a sharp contrast to the eurozone, then this type of framework may create tension between monetary policy financial condition and economic stability. And so that leaves me, that drives me to my third point, which uh, actually, and we haven't talked to each other, but is related to what uh, Benoit was saying, is that there are other policy tools to, to consider when we're looking at the macro policy framework. Um, there's prudential and supervision on the one hand, and there, and there is fiscal as well on the other hand. And what I would insist on here is that uh, the presentation will suggest that fiscal policy may have been pro-cyclical and contributed to 
fuel the acceleration of the CZ in comparison with your area, um, which would argue for a more balanced policy mix with tighter fiscal policy to moderate the business cycle. And that would allow central banks to actually have a more gradual monetary policy tightening and therefore exchange rate appreciation. And obviously that's assuming that trade tension do not escalate, but that was this morning discussion. Um, so what I will do today is I will first recall rapidly what the theoretical channels for monetary policy transmission and financial policy transmission um, sorry, are through trade, through finance. And then I will show you some empirical work which we have done at the OECD to assess the strengths of these channels and then come back uh, to the conclusion. So there, there are two categories of channels which can shape spillover, as you know, from the euro area to CZ countries, trade and finance. We've discussed extensively trade this morning, so what I will do here is simply focus on how your area monetary policy can affect uh, the CZ GDP and inflation through trade. And there are two main channels, as you know, the first one is the income effect. So if the euro area loses monetary policy, then it increases demand for non-euro areas, economies, exports of goods and services. This in turn tend to boost those economies output and it creates co-movement with the euro area output. But then there might be a second effect, which is an expenditure switching effect. So under a flexible exchange rate regime, when the euro area monetary policy becomes more accommodative, the CZ exchange rate should appreciate unless monetary policy will respond one for one. And in turn, the exchange rate appreciation should mitigate the increase in exports from the income effect. Altogether, the combined effect will depend on the elasticities of substitution and the degree of openness, which we discussed extensively this morning, um, and the extent to which the countries are actually integrated into the euro area value chain. But what I would like to focus on, which is why we have this chart here, is at least for these three OECD CZ countries, uh, even so de jure we have floating exchange rate regime in practice. Um, and this is not only relevant for, Ch for the Czech Republic, Hungary and Poland, but in practice most CZ countries have shown preference for limiting exchange rate fluctuation vis-a-vis -vis the euro. And in addition, um, what you can see from this chart is that most of the export of CZ countries to non-euro countries, like to your countries, obviously, uh, given the importance of value chains across Europe, are actually invoiced in euro, or actually it's more invoiced in euro for export than when you compare to other countries and for import it's slightly different because we have a commodity effect here. So if we add all this together, we're probably not really under a floating exchange rate regime and we could anticipate that the income effect should dominate and the transmission of your area GDP fluctuation or monetary policy impact on GDP fluctuation should uh, impact the CZ countries in about the same way. And before I move to the financial linkage, perhaps just a snapshot on inflation, where here we expect that inflation fluctuations are not so much reflecting what's happening in the euro area because of the importance of commodity and uh, prices, energy and food, energy which will tend to be invoiced in dollars. And also because over the recent period, there has been some country-specific idiosyncratic shocks, uh, like a lot of indirect taxes, employer social security contributions and statutory minimum wage movement in some of the CZ countries. Yeah. So that's, that's for the trade uh, effect. And now let me move to the financial one. So financial integration of economies can be reflected through three uh, main channels. One is portfolio holdings. The second will be non-financial sector borrowing, and the third will be cross-border banking. And what you see here is the stock of portfolio liabilities, and what we wanted to show with this chart is when you compare CZ countries with other neighboring countries of the euro area, 
which are in the EU, for example, then you can see that the role of the euro is much more important for CZ countries in terms of, of portfolio liabilities than for the others. So in theory, more accommodative uh, ECB, and I'm saying accommodative because it's to take an example, obviously, not because I take a stance on this, um, can, can affect financially CZ countries through the three channels. The first one will be the substitutability between EMU and CZ assets in portfolio. So if we abstract from safe haven effects, then lower euro area interest rates should put pressure on CZ interest rates as investors search for yield. Um, and indeed, we have observed that um, in this presentation, which will be on the web in the annex, you have a chart with short-term and long-term interest rates. And you can see that whether countries uh, in, in Central and Eastern Europe were at the zero, close to the zero lower bound or not, interest rates movement from the euro have impacted interest rates in the CZ countries. Uh, and when they were close to the zero lower bound, the spread has been compressed as well. So overall, when we have looser financial condition from this channel in the eurozone, then it translates into looser financial condition in CZ countries. The second channel is the balance sheet channel, which uh, you know well, and that relates to the one of the points that uh, Benoit Curé was alluding to, which is that to the extent CZ liabilities are in euros, while the assets may be in local currency, then more accommodative euro monetary policy should generate positive valuation effect. In fact, when we look at the evolution and what happened in CZ countries since the financial crisis, I think this channel is perhaps less prevalent than it used to, because the stock of euro-denominated loans to the non-financial private sector has been falling significantly in the wake of the crisis, and in particular for households in some countries. And again, there's a chart in the annex that, that shows that um, quite clearly. And then last but not least, there is the third channel, which is cross-border bank lending. Obviously, if we have more accommodative lending condition in banks in euro area countries or from euro area countries supplying loans to CZ countries, then that should support credit, bank credit to CZ countries. So altogether, if we, if we add all these channels with relatively stable exchange rates, more accommodative monetary condition in the euro area is expected to translate into more accommodative condition in CZ countries, both directly through the co-movement of EMU and CZ interest rates, but also indirectly because it improves the domestic funding condition. Um, and I think when we add the trade channel and the financial channel, then we can expect really a strong impact from the euro area monetary policy. So let me now turn to what we have found empirically, um, and I will present the results of two ways of looking at this, which are pretty much in line with what the literature in this area has suggested. And basically what uh, our empirical analysis confirms the importance of these two transmission channels. So first, we've used a very simple factor model analysis, which breaks the contribution to the variance of financial variables and also unreal variable into global, regional, regional being European, and country-specific factors. And what you can see here is that we are seeing a strong influence from the regional channel, so the European channel, on the movement in the 10-year government bond yield compare with the other channel, whether it's global or it's country specific. And you have three CZ countries, Hungary, the Czech Republic and Poland on the right hand side. And the red block, which is the European uh, contribution is much larger than for any of the other uh, area that we look at, whether it's non-EU or EU countries. We've done that for equity prices as well. And you find the same phenomenon where the European component is much larger than the global or the country specific uh, component. Uh, it's quite interesting to see that in Norway and the UK, for example, the country specific uh, component is very, very significant. 
And then we've also uh, done this decomposition for inflation. Uh, and like, as I discussed earlier, the results are, are, are very um, in line with what we should expect, meaning that this time the three OECD CZ countries are much more sensitive to the global condition and at the role of commodity prices than they are to um, the European factor. But even there, what we can see is that the European element uh, is still playing a significant role, but not bigger than for other EU neighboring countries. Uh, and finally, we do this decomposition for GDP growth. Um, and here as well, what we can see is a strong predominance of the European factor. And I think this reflects quite well the discussion that we had this morning on trade, which is how open and integrated into the value chain the CZ countries are, even if here we focus only on, on three of them. So that's, that's a very simple, nearly descriptive um, analysis. It provides evidence of co-movements, but it doesn't really look at, at the spillovers. It's just showing the share of which factor. So what we've done in another exercise is actually uh, have a large-scale Bayesian VAR models to gauge the main transmission mechanism of the spillover. And here I'm only showing the Czech Republic, but we have similar results for Hungary uh, and Poland. And it's once again confirming what we were, uh, what I was discussing in the, in the first part of, of this speech, which is the importance of the European factor for, uh, for the CZ countries. Uh, what you can see clearly is if the Eurozone lower interest rates uh, by one standard deviation, then we have the same type of shock on the interest rate, that's the left-hand side chart, then it vanishes as GDP, which is on the right-hand side chart, actually increases. Uh, and equity prices move a lot more as would be expected from this type of exercise. Um, I have not, we have not represented here the exchange rate channel because it, it, it was insignificant, which is indeed what we would expect if uh, the, the exchange rate was pretty much stable over the period. And again, these results hold for Hungary and Poland as well. Uh, so I think when we look at the short and limited uh, empirical evidence that I, I present here. Um, this is in line with what we know of the classic Mundell Fleming trilemma. So CZ countries have free capital flows with the euro area. So if they wish to pursue stable exchange rates, then monetary policy is not really autonomous. Um, and this is fine when the two regions are moving in a synchronized way, but it's much more complex, obviously, when the business uh, cycle di diverge. And when we look at the most recent period uh, since the crisis, the recovery has accelerated faster in CSE, in CSE countries than in the euro area. And inflation has recovered closer to the target, um, so that the high degree of monetary transmission may have actually contributed to two accommodative or more accommodative monetary policy in the CZ region that warranted by domestic condition. And what I want to show you uh, here, it's over the period 2015, 2018, some charts that I find really, really striking because they compare the last three years, that's the red dots, with the period before, which is 2007, 2014, and you look at the movement in interest rate compared with inflation, and you can see that the blue dot, which is the previous period, uh, seems much more, in a way, tighter. Or, or if you look at the red dot, you can see that it has taken much more time, and sometimes it hasn't even happened yet, for our short-term interest rate to go up in, in spite of the inflationary condition. Um, there's a difference which is clearly visible, for example, between the Czech Republic and Poland. If you look at the Czech Republic, monetary policy looks on this chart accommodative for a while, and over the most recent period, then there has been a hike in interest rates, so we're, we're converging towards the blue line and the, the former relationship that we had. But when we look at Poland, we can see that we're way below um, what 
would have been the case for this inflation in the previous period. So I, I quite like this chart because I think they show, they contrast very well how monetary policy uh, looks much more accommodative over the past three years than what it had been before for similar inflation. Um, and, and I would like to conclude here. Um, it's actually, I'm going to try and move into the annex if I have the time um, for one minute. Okay. What I want to show you here is the fiscal stance. Uh, because we have on the one hand monetary policy, which looks very, very accommodative. And on the other hand, and that's just for a short period, but we could take it uh, a little more. What we can see here is we have a very stimulative fiscal policy, uh, either in 2018 or 2019 for Poland, in spite of the fact that economic growth is very high and that inflation is picking up. Um, and I don't think I've put them here, but when you look at unit labor costs in these regions, they have increased very, very fast and they have squeezed profit margin and we can expect them to actually translate into uh, inflation quite soon. So let me go back on, uh, well, actually, since I'm here, you can see the interest rate movement uh, I was mentioning earlier. Um, so to conclude, and, and before I get stopped by the chair of the meeting, um, let me leave you with these three points. First, I think if, if pursuing a stable exchange rate with the euro so that there is strong monetary policy transmission from EMU, then CZ countries may have little room for maneuver with monetary tools. And this can be an issue when the business cycle appears desynchronized and the imported monetary policy is not really appropriate for domestic conditions. So some would say that uh, this could suggest that domestic central banks should react more forcefully to the domestic condition and let the exchange rate appreciate. Um, but what I would like to argue, and that's why I showed the, the last slide, is there's no reason to put all the burden of the adjustment on the shoulder of central banks. Um, what you could see uh, in the previous slide is fiscal policy has been and is being pro-cyclical in some countries, which together with sizable EU structural fund flows, because that provides a huge buffer, may have contributed to fuel economic activity more than was necessary given the strengths of the recovery. So it's the overall policy mix which may have been too supportive given the brisk economic momentum. And I think to the extent that the policy mix may create domestic imbalances, and I was mentioning the, the sharp appreciation of the unit labor costs, for example, then there may be some scope to use fiscal policy in a more counter-cyclical way, that is to tighten fiscal policy, which would allow central banks to actually tighten their monetary policy more gradually and with less exchange rate appreciation. Obviously, all this to the caveats that trade tension um, do not uh, increase. Um, and one last thing is, I think the financial condition of all the countries was very different, which is why I didn't get into this. Uh, but when we looked at it, some countries have really also taken very significant macroprudential measures. Uh, and I'm thinking, for example, of the Czech Republic. But in other countries, this transmission of monetary policy has also financial implication and, and their scope to discuss supervisory and um, prudential policy as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laurence. Uh, this uh, sets the stage very nicely and also uh, makes for a, a good transition uh, with uh, the discussion this morning. You've also shown how uh, trade structures uh, shape uh, the uh, sensitivity to, uh, to external shocks, uh, also in the, uh, in the macro and the financial field. Uh, e so I guess the punchline is that you is a, is a vindication of the Mundell uh, trilemma, but there are also elements of a dilemma no, in, in your presentation, because you also show how much the, uh, for instance, uh, long-term bond yields have been uh, uh, also um, impacted by, um, uh, by, um, by ECB policies. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and, and by the, so there is a, a global financial cycle, a regional financial cycle also, which interferes with, the, with these decisions. So um, I guess we'll have time to discuss it uh, further. And uh, I, without due delay, uh, I give the floor 
uh, to uh, Dubravko uh, Mihaljek from the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thanks to the organizer for this opportunity. I would like to extend a bit uh, the discussion so far. We've been talking about transmission of uh, real shocks, then uh, financial and monetary shocks from EU to this region. Now I would like to talk a bit about transmission of global uh, financial conditions to the region. So let me um, start with uh, this chart, um, uh, which is uh, showing uh, global pur purchasing managers indices for uh, manufacturing and services in the left hand panel. Um, the upshot is that the global economy is slowing. Um, um, you see the green line in the left hand panel below 50. So this means uh, uh, purchasing managers around the world are ordering less uh, and activity is, uh, is uh, no, no longer expanding, it's contracting. Uh, and then on the right hand panel, you see uh, um, further uh, explanation of what's happening. Global trade is uh, uh, no longer expanding. There has been this steep drop uh, uh, late last year, early this year. And then in particular, the blue line, the new export orders, uh, you see uh, uh, no, no longer expanding. They, they are contracting. Um, but interestingly, what's happening is that uh, at the same time, manufacturing is uh, on contracting. Uh, employment is still uh, relatively strong, and uh, capacity utilization is uh, uh, has been for a while uh, uh, holding up um, left-hand panel. In the ce center panel, you see that consumption is uh, uh, holding up well. Uh, PMIs that describe uh, um, consumer goods uh, and services purchases are still in the positive expansion territory. Uh, however, uh, what's uh, not so good for the outlook is that investment has weakened considerably. When you look at the right-hand panel, um, these are subcomponents of PMIs uh, for industrial goods, uh, for machinery and equipment, for electronic computing equipment. All these uh, at the global level are currently uh, in the contraction territory. Um, so, uh, what is happening? Uh, we know there are uh, trade tensions. Um, uh, we know there are uh, political uncertainties. Um, uh, and the region, uh, uh, Central Eastern, Southeastern Europe, has been affected through global value chains, uh, what we heard this morning, uh, uh, notably uh, German manufacturing. Um, and reflecting these developments uh, and uh, below inflation outcomes, uh, uh, monetary policy is uh, no longer tightening. Uh, um, when a draft program for this conference was first circulated in December of last year, um, Monetary policy normalization in the US was underway for, for three years. Uh, and in the, ECB, in the Euro area, ECB was taking initial steps uh, towards uh, normalization by ending net uh, bond purchases. Uh, now, against this uh, backdrop of a global slowdown, uh, uh, monetary uh, tightening is no longer imminent. So uh, where could... Uh, uh, this um, change in uh, financial conditions come from. Presumably, it could come uh, through a rise in risk premia. Uh, with still weaker trade outlook and political uncertainties, um, business and investor sentiment could be dented and uh, uh, risk spreads could widen. You, you can see, for instance, that they have already widened for uh, corporate bonds. Uh, 
uh, and for uh, uh, emerging market uh, bonds. Um, a particular concern uh, is uh, further strengthening of the dollar. Uh, there is a fairly uh, large body of literature which documents uh, an empirical relationship between the strength of the dollar and global financing conditions. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, graph seven, left hand panel, you see that uh, there is a interesting relationship with uh, when the dollar uh, nominal effective exchange rate uh, weakens, uh, financing conditions ease globally and uh, more credit is flowing to emerging market firms. And vice versa, when the dollar strengthens, as has happened uh, uh, over the past year and, and uh, earlier this uh, year, uh, this means tighter financing conditions and less credit flowing to EMEs. So we've heard a bit about the economics behind this uh, relationship. Uh, uh, on the supply side, uh, uh, credit worthiness of borrowers improves as dollar denominated liabilities uh, fall relative to domestic assets. Uh, this reduces tail risk in banks' credit portfolios, relaxes value at risk uh, or economic capital constraints, and creates capacity for additional lending. On the demand side, uh, uh, balance sheets of firms that borrow in dollars strengthen when dollar liabilities decline in domestic currency terms, and this may encourage more borrowing in dollars. So th these are some of the familiar uh, relationships. However, what is not widely known is that this the broad dollar index, uh, nominal effective exchange rate of the dollar, also, also tracks closely changes in global manufacturing activity uh, measured by PMIs. As you can see in the right-hand panel here, um, the, there is again an interesting uh, relationship between uh, uh, PMIs uh, for global manufacturing, which tend to uh, weaken when the dollar strengthens. Uh, and what's more interesting is that this uh, relationship holds not just for uh, advanced economy, for emerging market economies, as you would expect, but also for advanced economies. Uh, as this graph uh, shows, um, um, on the left-hand panel, um, uh, we have uh, PMIs uh, for Germany, Italy, and Austria, um, and uh, black solid line is uh, the dollar uh, nominal effective exchange rate. You see fairly close uh, inverse relationship. Right-hand panel shows the same uh, uh, for Czech Republic and Poland. Um, so uh, this is a bit surprising for Europe uh, because uh, we take it for granted um, that the euro, not the dollar, sets uh, uh, financing uh, conditions for the real sector in, in, in Europe. Uh, this association between the dollar and the real activity is, of course, a correlation. It's not a causation. But it's unlikely to be coincidental. It could reflect so-called working capital channel of trade fluctuations. Uh, um, and uh, this working capital channel um, features on one hand uh, global value chains uh, and on the other hand uh, prevalence of dollar in uh, invoicing in global trade. And the upshot of interaction of these two themes is that stronger dollar, as we can see indeed from these uh, uh, graphs, uh, is associated with tighter credit conditions for financing uh, working capital. Um, we don't know uh, how strong this working capital channel is in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, but we know what we heard uh, earlier, uh, that Central and Eastern Europe is uh, highly integrated with euro area, uh, real and financial sectors. Um, so 
This enables us to use insights from models of monetary and financial uh, spillovers via internationally active banks. Uh, um, what these, uh, uh, this literature tells us is that for domestic transmission of shocks, uh, uh, the key issue is understanding heterogeneity in individual banks' responses to domestic monetary shocks. And for international transmission, similarly, we also have to look at global banks' cross-country responses to monetary shocks. So, so what we've uh, talked so far about is mainly a, a case of borrower and lender countries. But what if the bulk of uh, cross-border lending is denominated in a third global currency? Uh, multinational banking groups raise funding and extend credit in a range of currency. Roughly half of BIS reporting banks' cross-border assets and liabilities are denominated in dollars, and about a third are in euros. So, this means that monetary policy of a third country, neither the lenders nor the borrowers, may also come into play in uh, cross-border uh, lending spillovers. Prominent examples are what uh, we are showing uh, here, what we have just shown before, US dollar and hence uh, Fed's monetary policy. A case that is familiar to Central Eastern Europe is uh, uh, Swiss franc and SMB monetary policy uh, a few years ago. So recent work at the, at the BIS has uh, shown that indeed uh, all three monetary policy lender countries, borrower countries, and then currency of the nomination uh, country monetary policy can all play a, a role in these uh, cross-border spillovers. And Again, the strength of transmission of these channels depends um, on frictions that banks face and borrowers face. Uh, so it's more a question of uh, uh, micro level, bank level uh, uh, situation that determines how strong is the transmission of uh, spillovers. So, um, one uh, study that I think is uh, of, of some interest to uh, uh, countries in this region is the one done by um, Hayek and Horvat, who examined specifically uh, shocks from Euro area and the US uh, and how they affect uh, economic activity and prices in uh, non-EU countries, uh, non non-Euro-EU countries, Bulgaria, Croatia, Czech Republic, Denmark, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Sweden, and UK. What you see in this graph uh, are uh, responses of industrial production uh, to a 100 basis point increase in the ECB shadow policy rate uh, by country over 12, 18, and 24-month periods from the model estimated by Hayek and Horvat. And uh, you can see from these dots that, uh, on average, um, industrial production growth falls by about uh, 0.5 percentage points uh, for a 100 uh, basis point increase in uh, shadow policy rate. The response to Fed's shallow, shadow policy rate increase is uh, somewhat smaller, but it's also statistically significant. Uh, so wh what do we uh, make uh, from this? Uh, what um, kind of, uh, sorry, what, what kind of um, uh, policy responses to financial shocks uh, uh, can we think of in, in uh, countries in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe? Um, overall, I think uh, uh, there is now a body of evidence which shows that real activity in uh, Central Eastern Europe is quite sensitive to changes in global financial conditions. 
So one implication uh, straightforward is uh, the need to monitor how these conditions evolve and how they spill over uh, to the domestic on economy through bank and non-bank credit. Um, um, when you look back uh, uh, to last year and early this year, financing conditions in the region have tightened slightly. This is based on EIB um, um, lending survey for the region. Funding conditions for international banking groups active in the region were easing uh, last year, supported by the growth of deposits, and collateral requirements were also easing. Uh, however, longer-term funding conditions uh, uh, have not eased. And this resulted in a, a gap between uh, demand for credit on the part of firms, especially for working capital, and uh, su supply of credit. Um, so if uh, global financial conditions uh, were to tighten further this year, uh, firms' access to finance could become a constraint to growth. Uh, Uh, what uh, sort of uh, responses could we then uh, think of? Um, I think one channel of um, transmission that is uh, important but is not often uh, um, uh, considered uh, um, in, in, in at length is that um, of credit constraint firms, especially SMEs. This morning, uh, uh, Deborah mentioned um, uh, th th this channel. In uh, small firms uh, are also financially more opaque and their owners often have to use uh, housing equity as collateral for firm credit. Uh, what this implies that changes in domestic policy rates and macroprudential regulations can have uh, pronounced effects on SME activity in some countries. Uh, some work that uh, my colleagues have done at, um, at the BIS uh, with firm level data show that indeed um, uh, this collateral lending channel can be economically important. Uh, for instance, in Spain and Italy, a one percentage point change in the growth of collateral values induces a, a 0.8 uh, a percentage point uh, change in liabilities of uh, SMEs and a similarly sized change in their investment. We are talking here about firms with less than half a million in, in total assets. Uh, uh, and furthermore, uh, these uh, changes in collateral values mostly affect employment in young firms, less than five years uh, old. Older firms are able to grow uh, um, employment from current revenues uh, rather than bank borrowing. Um, so um, since in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, access to bank credit is likely to be more constrained than in Italy and Spain, given the relative uh, state of development of their banking systems and legal frameworks, especially uh, that aspects uh, governing recourse, loan, informs, law info, loan enforcement, and bankruptcy resolution. I think uh, monetary policy potentially can have uh, important effects uh, through um, collateral value and, and, and this uh, balance sheet channel. Uh, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dwarfko. Um, there was a, uh, a fascinating uh, difference of uh, perspectives in the two presentations with Laurence focusing very much on uh, uh, CZ countries as neighbors of uh, the ECB and EMU and uh, you, Dubravko, focusing on the global, uh, taking the glo global perspective. And of course, both are important, so it's, it's really the two, two sides of the same, uh, of the same discussion. Um, and I would, I would really uh, like if we could spend a little bit of time later on discussing the banking channels, which you've started to, 
um, uh, to introduce in our discussion. It's a key policy issue, question for us as, as ECB and as, as, as Eurozone um, that we uh, take into consideration not only spillovers and spillbacks are from uh, EMU and into EMU as a monetary union, but also as a banking union. Uh, and so the cynical view would be it doesn't matter so much because we are an in incomplete banking union anyway and there are home host issues also inside uh, EMU. So maybe it doesn't matter so much whether you're inside EMU or outside EMU because there are home host issues everywhere. But if we move, if we can progress towards what is our objective to have a single uh, a banking area inside EMU, then uh, the issue will arise uh, uh, as to uh, which kind of spillovers we create for countries outside of EMU, and that would be very important for the transmission of shocks. So thank you for introducing that dimension. Um, let me, uh, so we now have four uh, panelists, um, and uh, the um, first uh, panelist is uh, Mugur Irisarescu, governor of the National Bank of Romania. Mugur, thank you for joining. Then, <clears throat> thank you, Benoit. I, I like to make uh, three short comments in my limited time. One is a about our topic. One is a general one, general comment. Uh, the other two will be related to the view from uh, uh, inflation uh, targeter uh, position. The first general one is um, what, what could we understand about the monetary policy normalization that generally meaning uh, is, or broadly speaking, is a policy no normalization which implies two processes. The first one is the withdrawal of uh, unconventional instruments uh, used after the outbreak of the global crisis. Uh, it's clear this is a difficult and a lengthy process uh, which involves adjusting the balance sheet of the central banks, particularly in the large central banks with the influence on the global asset prices. And the second process is the increase in the short-term interest rates. Uh, this is equally intricate one, uh, taking into account uh, its effects on financial stability and the current uh, relatively high indebtedness in, uh, all across the world, in particular in some countries in the uh, European Union. Then if you were supposed to ask me two months ago what is the policy normalization. I was supposed to say that the question is not when, uh, is not if this will, is going to happen, but when is going to happen. Now, as it was already said, and you said before me, and it's good that you said before me, uh, it's going not to be imminent, this kind of policy normalization, particularly related to the increase in the policy rates. Then let me say that it is debatable if the forthcoming normalization process involves going back to the pre-crisis normal or um, we are going to have a new normal which will be characterized by lower interest rate and possible by larger central bank balance sheets which will be for a pretty longer period of time. If you ask me now, I'm biased to say that uh, perhaps a new normal is going to, to happen, but this is only a comment I have. Uh, regarding the other two comments, uh, that will be from the position of the National Bank of Romania, which is an inflation targeter, that uh, we are exactly like Poland, Czech Republic, and uh, Hungary central banks, an inflation targeter, uh, since 2005. We define from the very beginning that we are considering and we consider a light inflation targeting. For example, we never accepted to have a free floating uh, because of sensitivity of uh, exchange rate movement in the Romanian economy. And uh, we had a managed floating, for example, but in the meantime, it was changed. What is happening is that we remain loyal to the inflation targeting, but the inflation targeting is no longer loyal to us, that it was so many changes into the inflation targeting uh, framework that uh, particularly in the last several years, uh, it's something like a different uh, uh, framework. Um, and uh, I, I will say only 
two words about two underlying principles. One is that uh, after the outbreak of the global crisis and in the post-crisis development, um, that uh, it was a departure from the, the old orthodoxy, particularly on the related to the exchange rate uh, policy. For example, be before the crisis, forex interventions were more or less considered to be uh, damned, you know, no, not good. Now, and uh, it was Czech uh, Central Bank which started with this, it was going somewhere to a full commitment to, for a period, it's true, uh, in the, since 2013 to 2017, to have exchange rate commitment and to intervene with our time or volume limits to prevent the appreciation of the corona. I quote uh, what the Czech Central Bank said. We're not in this position, but we did intervene in the, the forex market to alleviate the large fluctuations of the uh, forex, and particularly to discourage forex credit, which uh, we discovered that is undermining the monetary policy, that we are tightening, for example, monetary policy to curb inflation, but uh, aggregate demand was uh, rampant, was uh, increasing via forex credit, which was very uh, dangerous. And in this respect, I found that also the general manager of BIS, Augustin Carstens, said that this is a general trend in, uh, in all the emerging markets, not only in the European Central and Eastern European countries with uh, inflation targeting, to have a new definition of um, inflation targeting, which is based more on the intervention of the forex market. The second is with the macroprudential tools, which were now clearly a part of inflation targeting. That I could say that inflation targeting is no longer so clean as it was 10 years ago, and perhaps it's for better because the central banks have now more to say, not mandates, more goals to achieve. It's also related to financial stability. We ask from time to time not to discourage economic growth. Uh, we are under a populist attack, that's not only uh, in the Eastern Europe, also in Southeastern Europe I have seen and in the Central Europe. The, the second or the third comment is related to the policy rate uh, or the, what is the central bank in our area doing with the policy rate. But uh, look what is the situation. The, Classic uh, recipe for inflation targeting was to recommend a policy rate hike uh, when the inflation was moving up and to have positive uh, policy rate and generally positive uh, money market rates. However, if you look to all the countries like inflation target, Czech Republic, Poland and Hungary and also Romania, we have now negative interest rates and our policy rate is below the inflation. We increased three times in Romania the policy rate last year, but we stopped. Why? Because, for example, in Romania inflation is around 4%. Policy rate is 2.5%. In Hungary is uh, also around 4%, 3.9%, and uh, uh, inflation. And the policy rate is 0.9%. And we discovered that we are moving only in this direction. There are the danger of having capital inflows to appreciate the currency, and we have a problem with balance of payment. We have a current account deficit. Then we have to be very careful to, uh, to this movement. We prefer, for example, to tighten money conditions through, a, uh, to say, uh, the liquidity control domestically, and not to increase the policy rate and to have more, more flexibility. But I couldn't say this is the good advice to the others. It, it was a kind of innovation because I discovered, and we discovered, there are a lot of innovations, not only in Romania, all around the world. And uh, looking forward, and now I'm going to read because we are not, uh, we, don't, don't, we don't have formal guidance. And uh, regarding the future, I like to be constructive ambiguity, what we are going to do. Looking forward, the National Bank of Romania future policy actions, 
will definitely depend on the way monetary policy normalization unfolds in Europe. What happened in the emerging economies, for example, that are part of the US dollar's fair influence following the Fed's policy normalization is quite relevant. Higher interest rates in the developed world, in the US, would trigger a capital flight away from emerging economies, thus generating depreciation pressures. The response of policymakers in emerging economies will depend on the specific strengths and weaknesses. Where adequate policy buffers are in place and investor confidence is elevated, market mechanism, countercyclical macroeconomic and prudential policy may be relied upon to tackle a slowdown in capital inflows. Where there is less room for maneuvering, tighter monetary and fiscal policy, policies may be required to lower fin uh, financing needs and attract additional inflows. Where foreign reserves are adequate, they may be used to moderate or smoothen exchange rate depreciation. Vice versa, if the situation of, in Europe will remain with a pretty low or quite negative interest rates, for inflation target, I guesstimate, will be very difficult to increase policy rates and money market rates. Otherwise, there is the danger of uh, um, exchange rate appreciation, which first reaction is this is good for inflation going down. But if you have, as is a remaining case, if you have a problem with the current account deficit, this is only worsening uh, the situation and only postponement of the, uh, of the problems. Then let me uh, to say a conclusion. It follows that when the normalization wave hits, the magnitude of the impact will depend on how vulnerable emerging economies and our countries, we consider Central and Eastern and Southeastern Europe uh, like emerging economies, or of course, the Republic is not, are to external financing. A contained current account deficit, a long average maturity on public and private foreign currency debt and coherent mix of counter-cyclical macroeconomic policies and structural reforms would uh, go a long way in limiting the risks. If proper economic policy actions are not implemented while there is a window of opportunity, the possibility of a forced resort in a more or less distant future to the suboptimal and improvised measures in the face of adversity cannot be ruled out. To sum up, keeping uh, domestic and external imbalances in check is the only way the, our countries will be able to cope with any strong volatility headwinds. This is not difficult to be said in wording. It's much more difficult to be put in practice, particularly when there are election years like we have now in Romania this year and next year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mugur. Well, since you were wondering, I think the, the working assumption that uh, monetary policy tightening in the Eurozone is not immediate uh, is, a, uh, is a relevant assumption for our discussion. So Dimitar, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, I, I will focus on, on, on the transmission of ECB monetary policy to the region as I was asked uh, from the country-specific perspective of Bulgaria. My understanding is Galina and Nadim will look at it uh, from the regional angle. Uh, I will uh, say a few words about the, the, the transmission of the, the ECB policy. After that, I will shortly refer to the uh, policy response uh, to, to the changing monetary conditions, and uh, finally I'll say a few words uh, about the macroprudential measures that we introduce uh, to address uh, the related uh, uh, financial stability risks. Uh, needless to say, the ECB's monetary policy plays an important, important role for economic activity in the region, uh, due to, as, as was mentioned several times, uh, to the high openness of the CZ economies, and their strong trade and financial links with the euro area. Uh, 
recent empirical uh, studies point to spillover effects from ECB's monetary policy to non-euro area EU economies, irrespective of the exchange rate regime. Depending on the specific structural features of the economies, however, the strength of the transmission can vary across countries. Uh, for Bulgaria, the key features that determine the, the direct transmission of ECB's monetary policy are related to the country's uh, currency bond arrangement uh, with fixed exchange rate of the, of the national currency against the euro and the country's strong trade and financial integration with the euro area. Uh, under the currency bond arrangements, which work, put here. Okay. Uh, under the currency board arrangements, domestic monetary conditions are largely determined by the monetary environment in the euro area. Uh, the chart that you can see illustrates the parallel dynamics, uh, respectively, uh, of the LF and euro area overnight index averages. Uh, an additional prerequisite for a strong pass-through of ECB's monetary poli policy to the domestic banking system is the dominant role of the euro area uh, uh, on banks in the Bulgarian banking sector. At the same time, uh, around 50% uh, of exports are destined to the euro area, and the euro area investors uh, account for 67% of the stock of FDIs. Uh, the effects of the direct transmission of ECB's policy measures since mid-2014 could be illustrated with the high liquidity of the banking sector and the sustained decline over the period in interbank money market interest rates and in interest rates uh, on deposits and loans against the background of strengthening macroeconomic conditions. As for the channels of transition, Transmission, one, uh, our research suggests that the effects of ECB monetary policy changes are transmitted to Bulgarian, Bulgaria's economic activity mainly through the foreign trade channel. The effects from the change in interest rates and asset prices represented in this research by residential property prices take more time to materialize and affect economic activity to a lesser extent compared to the trade channel. Uh, a few words, uh, words on our policy response since 2016. Uh, just to give you a flavor, I, I'll focus on one, uh, one policy action uh, with regard to the bank reserves uh, and accounts uh, with the uh, BNB. Uh, given our monetary framework, the ECB's decision to introduce a negative interest rate on its deposit facility in June 2014 let banks operating in Bulgaria to start holding excess reserves in their accounts with the, with the central bank, since the interest rate on excess reserves at that time was zero. As a result, the 10 2015 bank deposits with the central bank in excess of the minimum required reserves reach almost 130% on average daily basis. To address these developments, we changed in 2016 our policy with respect to the required reserves of banks. We introduced a definition of excess reserves for bank accounts held with the BNB and introduced the interest rate on the deposit facility of the ECB to be applied on the excess reserves when this interest rate is negative. Zero interest rate is applied on excess reserves when the ECB deposit facility rate is positive or zero. The changes uh, led to a strengthened, uh, these changes in fact led to a strengthened propagation of ECB's interest rates to the Bulgarian economy. Bank success reserves, however, remain sizable. That is why, as from October 2017, the central bank introduced an extra minus 20 basis points at top of the ECB deposit facility interest rate, with which bank success reserves held at the BNB are charged. As a result, there has been a downward trend in excess reserves from about 56% in October 2017 to about 26% uh, of uh, minimum required reserves on average daily basis uh, in April 2019. Uh, should illustrate this with the, uh, with the next chart, uh, which uh, uh, gives an idea about the changes in our bank reserves and excess reserves along with the ECB deposit facility rate. Uh, Finally, a few words about the financial stability implications that, in my view, are very, very important. 
The prolonged period of uh, accommodative monetary policy of the ECB has helped the recovery of economic activity throughout the EU, but it has also increased the potential of build-up of financial stability risks. In the CZ countries, and in Bulgaria more specifically, the favorable financing conditions, improving macroeconomic environment and high liquidity in the banking system have stimulated credit activity, while at the same time residential property prices have been increasing at relatively high rates. Uh, to limit potential risks, uh, we did mainly two things. First, we strengthened our macro prudential framework, and second, we activated the counter-cyclical capital buffer. The key element of strengthening macro prudential powers of the, of the central bank was the establishment in 2018 of the legislative basis for borrower-based measures, requirements such as LTV, LTI, uh, in addition to the existing capital-based measures. Uh, as for the activation of the counter-cyclical capital buffer, we to took two decisions so far. First, in 2018, we set the counter-cyclical capital buffer rate applicable to credit uh, risk exposures uh, in Bulgaria at 0.5%, in effect from October 1st, 2019. And second, early this year, we further increased the rate to 1%, in effect from April 1st, 2020. Uh, it's, probably, uh, it's probably important to say that the rate is applied to the overall credit stock of banks and not to the volume of newly issued loans. It was also announced that uh, the central bank uh, could increase the rate to a higher level earlier in the event of a significant acceleration of credit growth. These decisions were taken despite the fact that the standard metric for deviation of the credit to GDP ratio uh, from its uh, long-term trend remain deeply in negative territory. This estimation, uh, however, is sensitive to the time series sample and cannot provide timely indication about turning points. Therefore, the decision for the increase of the counter-cyclical capital buffer rate uh, were taken considering the relatively high growth rate of credit as well as on the basis of an in-depth analysis of the financial cycle. The chart, uh, uh, the last chart that I have, in fact, displays our aggregate measure of the financial cy uh, cycle. It can be seen that in 2017, the economy was entering the initial phase of uh, cyclical risk accumulation. Uh, to wrap up, uh, I would, uh, I would uh, like to emphasize the, the following points. First, the monetary policy of the ECB uh, plays an important role for economic activity in the CZ region because of the high openness of the economies and their strong trade and financial links with the euro area. For, in Bulgaria, the, the currency board arrangements lead to a direct transmission of the ECB, ECB's monetary policy to the economy. Uh, second, the substantial monetary policy stimulus provided by the ECB through its non-standard monetary policy measures has contributed to strengthening the monetary policy transmission to the region. Uh, the BNB has introduced changes to its policy with respect to the required reserves of banks, which have led to faster and stronger propagation of the ECB interest rates to the Bulgarian economy. And finally, the prolonged period of accommodative monetary policy of the ECB and the spillover effects to the region create potential financial stability risks that need to be addressed with uh, adequate macroprudential measures, including by strengthening the macroprudential powers of uh, relevant authorities, uh, the central bank in our case, and activating, activating the counter-cyclical capital buffers. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitar. Of course, this becomes even more important now that, now that Bulgaria has a clear perspective to join the, uh, both the uh, exchange rate mechanism and the banking union. So that's uh, your, your unique in that perspective compared to the, to the neighboring countries. Um, so we're now going to, uh, to conclude uh, by, uh, we, with a broadening of the discussion uh, with the views of the World Bank and the, and the IMF. So let me give the floor to Galina Vincelet for the World Bank. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak here at this conference today. Um, I will indeed a little bit broaden the discussion, but at the same time focus it on the six Western Balkan countries. 
And I'll change a little bit my remarks, as previous speakers did very eloquently explain the transmission channels through which eventual normalization or a financial um, uh, conditions change could affect the uh, countries of the Western Balkans. Instead, I would like us to think about what are the conditions in these six countries should an eventual shock uh, uh, arrive. Um, so I'll focus on the public sector, the private sector, and then think about what policymakers can do uh, today. Starting with the public sector, um, last few years we have seen a significant improvement in fiscal positions of the six Western Balkan countries. This being said, public debt and, uh, remains still at relatively high levels. Countries like uh, Montenegro and Albania have public and publicly guaranteed debt which stands at 70 or above percent of GDP. North Macedonia and Serbia are hovering around the 50 percent mark as well. Um, moreover, and importantly, public debt is with a significant external component, which means that, uh, for example, in Montenegro or in Serbia, a uh, significant part of the debt is uh, actually um, is, 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 is external, and this is quite, quite important. Several of the Western Balkan countries also are running elevated external and domestic imbalances. So this taken together, um, would imply that a higher interest rate uh, spending could crowd out productive spending in infrastructure as well as social spending. It could also pose challenges for rollover of external debt and may become more costly, given the dependence on uh, these countries on foreign financing. For the private sector, and given the global um, investment uh, decline, as Dubrovko showed us very nicely in, in the chart, that would mean that there is a real threat of reducing private investment rates in the countries. At the end of 2018, private investment for the region stood at about 18%, and this is not high. Uh, this is this is this this uh, for 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 these countries to really um, ignite growth and to uh, reignite convergence. Investment rates will need to be significantly higher. Capital needs to deepen uh, more. Uh, moreover, private investment in some of the countries continues to, to grow at rates slower than the rates of growth of the economy. This means that investment is shrinking as a share of economic activity. I'll give you the example of Serbia here, where in, in 2018, last year, growth of private investment was 2.5% compared to economic growth of 4.2%. If we take a little bit of a longer perspective of the last decade, we see that private investment has practically stagnated in uh, this, this country. Looking at foreign direct investment, again, FDI in the region remains low. It is at about 5, 5.5% of, of GDP uh, today. Um, again, you know, has come down significantly after the global uh, financial crisis. But what is important about FDI is it's, its weak structure. And what I mean by that is that large FDI flows into real estate, tourism and construction, uh, for example, usually have short time horizons, they are not strategic, and in case of a shock can dry up very quick. So this type of FDI is large in many countries in the Western uh, Balkans. For example, uh, half of FDI in Montenegro goes into the tourism industry, but FDI into real estate accounts for about one-fifth in Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, North Macedonia, Kosovo, and in Serbia it is at about one-quarter. 
Real estate investments are also not productive once completed, and large tourism projects often rely on primary uh, imported goods and services, and thus have very few backward linkages to the domestic economy. And this is a point I want to, to, to repeat and emphasize, uh, and, and this is the point about the importance of FDI in creating backward linkages to the real economy, if FDI is to be durable, if FDI is to be sustainable. We see countries in the region that have high share of FDI in manufacturing or backbone services uh, actually doing better. They're more embedded in domestic supplier networks and they're more embedded in global value chains, as we heard earlier today. They're in better positions overall to withstand shocks. So against this backdrop of high public and publicly guaranteed debt, low private investment rates, weak FDI, low and weak FDI structures, um, as well as not to forget the limited flexibility of the monetary policy in these countries uh, that either have unilaterally euroized, adopted the euro as their currency like Kosovo and Montenegro, or have fixed packs to the euro or currency boards. Against this backdrop, what we worry about is that um, eventual normalization of uh, monetary policy in the developed world or a um, change in financing conditions basically will expose structural weaknesses in uh, the region and lead to a reduction or to a further reduction of potential GDP growth. Here, higher investment rates are really needed to rekindle the income convergence, which we heard this morning, and its importance of it, um, especially more private investment, I want to emphasize, given the limited fiscal space that many of these uh, governments um, uh, have. So what could be done in this, uh, in, in this situation? Well, reform momentum is needed, and this is the title of our latest regular economic uh, report on the Western Balkans, which I have promised to make available to our organizers. Reform momentum is needed, and I want to emphasize two pillars of this reform uh, momentum. Number one, it is strengthening of the fiscal positions of these countries. And here to echo the message of uh, Lawrence on, on the fiscal point, it's, it's, it's really critical. And second, it is about structural uh, policies. On the fiscal side, improving the efficiency of public spending is paramount. In the Western Balkans, for example, public spending is still dominated by spending on public wages and poorly targeted social benefits, which account for about uh, half of the total spending in all of the countries and for about two-thirds of spending in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Accelerating public administration and social sector reforms are also critical. And better public investment management, or how capex, how capital expenditures are managed and directed, is of uh, really big importance for growth and for increasing growth potential. There is work in an agenda, big agenda, on the revenue side as well. And here I want to point a couple of areas where uh, also the World Bank as well as other international financial uh, organizations are uh, working actively. These are the areas on generous tax expenditures as well, about, as, well as about um, tools available for strengthening tax administrations. Um, another important agenda is the progressivity of taxes, especially progressivity of um, uh, personal income tax. Um, and the last, and I'll be very brief, happy to take questions later on this, is the structural uh, policy agenda. And here it is, again, about boosting the potential uh, growth in these countries, starting from um, entry, co competition on equal terms, um, and exit. So here, bottom line is reinforcing the public institutions to ensure that no one benefits from special treatment in the domestic market would encourage entrepreneurs to enter the market, innovate, exit if they have to, expand the pool of younger uh, and more productive firms, and ultimately create jobs in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Galina. And now, uh, last but not least, uh, Nadine Hilai for the IMF. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, uh, let me start by thanking the ECB for a very, very interesting day of, uh, of a conference and for inviting me to speak on this issue. Um, let, me, let me start by saying that uh, uh, when we got these, uh, these sort of topics that, that had been outlined in the, for the session, uh, they made us think a lot, and in fact, uh, you may actually find some papers coming out down the road because we thought that the answers were not there, at least immediately looking at the data. And uh, so what I'm going to present does not actually show any serious econometric work, which I think Laurence and her team are probably more advanced on that, uh, but a, sort of a broad trend of, of how we see things and a bit of an event analysis and a bit of a comparative analysis between uh, countries that peg and, and have a hard, hard uh, currency uh, uh, fixed exchange rates versus the floaters. Um, so, so let me touch on, I think a lot has been said, I don't want to repeat, so I'll go quickly through my uh, story in eight slides. Uh, what we did first is look at, okay, well, ECB spillovers um, to the region. And one thing we did was we said, okay, well, look, let's look at the last round. We had um, the APP program in 2014, and what happened to exchange market pressures? in these countries. Um, and exchange market pressures, as you know, is, is reflected by an index, which shows that it can show up in three ways. Um, changes, in the, uh, changes in reserves, changes in uh, exchange rate, and changes in the policy rate. And, and that's really what uh, uh, the three components would be. There can't be a fourth one. So the idea is to see how those in these uh, five countries, six countries behaved, uh, Bulgaria, uh, Croatia, Hungary, Poland, and Romania. And as you can see, there is a, there is a very slight uptick in these pressures, uh, in the exchange market pressures, since the introduction of the, of the unconventional monetary policy in the last round. And they seem to have, they seem to have trended down since the turmoil uh, began in the emerging markets last year. Now, uh, the other thing we did was to look at, okay, well, um, how did uh, various uh, macroeconomic and, and other economic indicators behave uh, just after the introduction of the, of the last round of unconventional monetary policy in, by the ECB? Um, and here we have uh, what the results we have, I mean, these are not results, these are basically plots, and you can see basically that uh, there is hardly any difference between the exchange rate regime that you may have here between the floats and the managed floats and on one side and the and the pegs and currency board and and fixed exchange rate on the other and the only place you see differences is that uh, after the unconventional monetary policy was introduced by ecb the uh, peg countries showed a faster increase in in nominal credit uh, to the private sector, uh, and that the uh, float and managed float had a slightly lower real exchange rate appreciation over the period following that um, action or during the period that this was going on. Um, yields, uh, we looked at long-term government bond yields between float, managed float, and, and the Eurea peg. And here also, starting from 2015, uh, the trend seems to be that uh, the, the pegged and the fixed exchange rate countries saw a reduction in yields over time. Um, now, I think what Laurence presented is probably more formal and probably has more weight in the sense of the variance decomposition and all that and the euro, and the euro factor. So both these results have to be at least our results have to be taken with a, with a pinch of salt here. Um, let me focus on uh, the last year's turmoil and what that meant for the region. Um, and this, this did not have a straight answer because it depends on which data you use and, and, and it depends on how you, how you, uh, what denominator you use in the data. So uh, what we did was we tried to do two things here. One is, a, as you can see, this is May 18 to May 19, so one year. And uh, we show how uh, the new member states of the EU behaved relative to Latin America and emerging Asia over the course of the, of the turmoil. And uh, then we put that against the taper tantrum that happened between June of 13 and June of 14. So the, 
The time chart at the x-axis does not belong to the taper tantrum, but it's also one year duration. So you can see in, in perspective that, that the last year's turmoil is much weaker, much milder than, than what happened during the, term, uh, the, the taper tantrum. Um, financial conditions are also difficult to measure based on data. We use the EPFR data here, and, and what we did was we plotted the financial condition index for um, Czech, Hungary, and Poland against uh, sort of these nine large emerging markets. Uh, and again, you can see um, sort of tightening of conditions uh, as the sort of a, a emerging mar market turmoil was, was, uh, was unfolding, and then after September of 18, things begin to ease off pretty much in line with the other EMs. Um, I think one point uh, that got made here a little bit but uh, is worth mentioning is uh, that in a macroeconomic vulnerability sense, the SESI countries are in a very different place than they were prior to the unfolding of the global financial crisis. And this may be the reason why the spillovers to the region are not so severe. Uh, because the channels of those, the taps of those spillovers have been turned down or turned off. Um, let me start by the top left, which shows the current account balance and the progression. You can see there's been a substantial reduction in the current account balances um, over uh, these last so many years, uh, to, the, to the extent that you can now say the region is, except for a few countries, fairly, um, um, the external imbalances have been brought under control. Fiscal buffers have been built up. Is the glass half full or half empty? Um, yes, they should have been built up even more. Uh, fiscal policy has been, uh, has been uh, sort of expansionary, uh, not, as, not, as, uh, con not as contactionary as it should have been, given the, whether the, these countries are in the cycle. But nevertheless, the, the debt uh, buffers are, are much uh, better than they were at the, uh, the peak fallout from the crisis. Um, the bottom left shows how deposits have become a lot more important source of bank funding. So the channel of external financing, external funding that was spilling over and could have provided a, challenge, a channel of spillovers from external side has also been reduced. Uh, and not surprisingly, nominal credit growth which uh, uh, despite the strong uh, sort of uh, output uh, beyond potential in many of these countries um, for, a, for a few years, we have a nominal credit growth that has not been growing, that has not been very high. And, and I think that again points to sort of the prudence of policies uh, across the board. Let me finish by my last chart here, which comes out of our regional economic outlook. And uh, you have to excuse me if it's not updated because I think they stopped uh, this data back in September last year. But I think it shows an interesting trend. And, and what it was was for, for all of, all of uh, uh, Europe showing how macroprudential measures have been increasingly introduced in these countries. And what I did was I, I put a green mark around the SESI countries. And it turns out a lot of the SESI countries have actually introduced a lot of these measures. And, and that... Uh, in the end, uh, we have a paper that will come out soon that, that will show that, <clears throat> in fact, these measures have, one thing they've done is they have, they have restrained the very risky lending uh, that took place, uh, for example, prior to the crisis. Uh, whether they had an impact on, on credit growth or house prices is, is questionable, but, but the fact that, that again, the, the, the vulnerabilities, channels that come through, through external flows have been dampened or have been shut down. So let me stop here and uh... thank you very much, sir Nadim. I mean, can we give a round of applause to all the speakers because I think they deserve it. <laughs> and uh, since uh, they've been very disciplined uh, and, uh, and behaved, uh, we have uh, 45 minutes or so for a discussion, which is, uh, which is uh, really good. Um, let me start with uh, coming back to the, uh, all the speakers uh, and ask before I, I open the floor more broadly and ask if there is any uh, comment you would like to share on what the others have said or anything that you forgot to say. Uh, and uh, maybe just to, 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 to kick off that discussion, I would like to come back to a, what I uh, 
understood as a difference between what Laurence said and what Dubrav Dubravko said, uh, but I may, I may be wrong, uh, which is analytically quite important to understand the spillovers from the Eurozone. Uh, Laurence said basically the Euro does matter a lot because of uh, Euro invoicing in, uh, in uh, CZ countries. And